December 1971, the courtyard of a resort hotel on the western coast of Mexico. This man is a wholesale supplier of illegal drugs produced in Mexico. He has done business before with this American pilot experienced in smuggling. We got along good and we trusted each other as much as he can trust a gringo and I can trust a Mexican connection. The sale and smuggling of Mexican produced drugs is a billion dollar business. The products of the business are carefully and illegally cultivated in remote areas of Mexico. Top grade marijuana, famous for its potency and trade names. Aquapoca Gold, Topico Blue, Yucatan Red. Another homegrown product of the business, poppies that produce opium, marketed by Mexican entrepreneurs. What good will do me if I have 100 acres of uh, opium, if I didn't have any buyer for it? What could I do for it? I'll go hungry, right? But if I have 100 kilos over there of uh, opium, I have all visitors from the States, anything else, offer me anything to get. The opium taken from the poppy pot is converted to heroin, usually brown, sometimes white. Success in the Mexican narcotics business depends, of course, on ability to smuggle drugs to the major marketplace, a U.S. customs official. Well, the enemy are groups of young college people, some of the old-time dirty leg smugglers. Uh, it's anybody and, and everybody. What do you bring from Mexico, sir? Not a thing. United States citizen? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much. And have you acquired any merchandise in Mexico to declare? Nothing at all? Stop over there, number one. I was born in Chihuahua, Mexico, of oh. American parents. Okay. Do you any baggage with you? No, nothing at all. Okay, thank you. At nightclubs on the border, a successful smuggler may celebrate and listen to songs about this flourishing business. The lyrics of a song called Carga Blanca. They crossed the Rio Bravo almost at dusk with plenty of white cargo that they had to sell. With 1,800 pesos the Americans paid them, they delivered their load, some of the best stuff. Don't make any moves if you don't want to die hand over the money that you just received. Why won't you take me out of here? I don't like this. However, you may waive the right to advice of counsel and your you right to remain jail, silent. Take me. You may answer Some questions. are caught, but the traffic in drugs from Mexico continues. Why it continues is what the next hour is all about. Eight months ago, this reporter began an investigation that required some hobnobbing with gangsters, simple farmers, college boys, and pilots. You will meet some of these people tonight. They have a common involvement with the subject of this broadcast, the traffic in two Mexican-produced drugs, marijuana and heroin. Ten years ago, the Mexican marijuana business was a penny-ante operation. Today, most of the marijuana sold in the U.S. comes from Mexico and an estimated $1 billion worth of it will be sold here this year. Ten years ago, Mexican heroin rarely was found outside the black ghetto. Today, up to 80% of the heroin sold in the white suburbs of our western states comes from Mexico. This year, an estimated $900 million of Mexican heroin will be smuggled across the Mexican-U.S. border. Our report begins here with the obvious. 1,900 miles of border offer vast possibilities for smuggling. Moving west from the Gulf of Mexico, the border for more than 1,200 miles is the unfenced banks of the Rio Grande River. The Mexicans call it the Rio Bravo, the Brave River. In the Big Bend country bordering Texas, the river twists through canyons and wilderness and ends west of El Paso, Texas. From here, the border for another 700 miles extends mostly through sagebrush and desert to the Pacific Ocean. Only 27 of those miles are fenced. Five districts of U.S. Customs agents front on the Mexican border. District 8 includes 450 miles of riverbanks and lakeshore. Here is the situation in this district, according to special agent in charge, Bill Hughes. It's a war. Uh, that's what the situation is. And it's the same way in all of our other districts along the, the Mexican border. Uh, we've got killings. Uh, we've got uh, lots of people trying to get lots of narcotics into this country. Uh, they're coming across the lakes by, with boats. They're coming through the air with airplanes. They're driving the river with four-wheel trucks. Uh, 
it's a, it's a good size wall. The largest Mexican town across the river from District 8 is Nueva Laredo. The competition for millions of U.S. dollars spent for Mexican drugs is most apparent here. For 18 months, a gangland war has been underway, and Nuevo Laredo is being called the Little Chicago of the border. So far, 18 known narcotics traffickers and two Mexican police officers have died here suddenly and violently. This bar was blasted by two machine gunners firing from a car. Three people were killed inside. Jukeboxes blare songs about the killings in the narcotics war. Among the deceased, Juan Hernandez, shot and found in the Rio Grande River with a rock tied to his body. Carlos Maldonado, machine gunned on a street corner. Fausto Inahosa, machine gunned at home in front of his wife and children. In this restaurant, an agent of the Federal Judicial Police, Alvaro de Leon Betancourt, was shot by drug trafficker Refugio Proneda. Later, Proneda's body was dumped in front of this ranch owned by the Proneda clan. Proneda's mother, Simona, is said to be the brains of one of the largest narcotics rings on the border. In Mexico, enforcement of narcotics laws is under the jurisdiction of the federal judicial police. But there are only 300 federal judicial police agents in all of Mexico, and only two are stationed in Nuevo Laredo. By their own admission, they are no match for the well-armed gangs of the drug traffickers. This reporter found that contacting the drug traffickers is not very difficult if you pose as a potential buyer. A barber who learned to speak English in a U.S. penitentiary said he could arrange for the purchase of one pound of heroin. How much would you think would be in that? It'd be over a pound. Over a pound? Yeah. It'd be over a pound. Not a brain. The price for one pound of Mexican heroin, $12,000. But of course, no one buys without first obtaining a sample. Have you tested that sample? No. I'll take it with me. You want to do whatever you want to do with it. You know this other guy in town, right? The one that you told me uh, packs the 45? Does he still carry that 45? <laughs> huh? He forgets his pants first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He says, I feel naked without my gun. Yeah? Is he selling some too? He might. Would you like to meet him? I'd like to meet him. The meeting took place in this restaurant. The barber introduced a man named Tulis. This is uh, Tulis. Jay. Jay. Tulis, who spoke only in Spanish, offered to sell one ounce of heroin for $700. Later, after this meeting, we learned more about Tulis from a U.S. customs agent. Yes, sir, that's a dope dealer. His name's Tulis Valadez. He's a fugitive from the United States on a murder charge. You expect to meet underworld figures in the heroin business, but who is involved in profiting from the traffic in marijuana? Customs agent in charge, Bill Hughes. People are concerned, of course, with hard narcotics, and there's a lot of money in hard narcotics. But uh, young people can get into the, or people who are not previously uh, identified as criminals can get into the marijuana traffic relatively easy with a few bucks. And they can make hundreds of thousands of dollars. Some of them are retired. Bill Estes was involved with a group that smuggled 5,000 pounds of marijuana into the United States. Before he was arrested in Customs District 8, Estes was an accountant and third-year law student at the University of Oklahoma at Norman. We asked him about the profits of the marijuana business. Well, uh, on one trip, if you buy a half a ton of marijuana, which is a, a normal one, one uh, trip load, it costs $20,000 and you sell it for $100,000, so you have an $80,000 profit. So you're talking about a 400% profit. Yes, it, I don't think it and makes that much. When you were first approached, did you understand how much money might be involved? Well, yes, sir, I knew before that before I was approached because I know a lot of people that uh, have smuggled marijuana and quit and a lot of young people 18, 19 years old have made a half a million dollars and quit. But what uh, kinds of people are you talking about? You're a young man. How old are you? 25. And these people you were talking to, about how old are they? Same age, uh, younger and some older, mostly uh, working on their second degree, masters or doctorate and uh, all educated. Customs agents Jim Kirkendall and Ramiro Villarreal have met a number of those well-educated marijuana smugglers. 
nowadays it seems that the so-called nice middle class college kids feel that they have to resort to uh, guns, rifles, what have you. We've known on occasions where the time when they are loading or actually smuggling the contraband, they'll have armed guards with high part rifles and scopes sitting on the riverbank. Not only college boys are involved. The night of November 17, 1971, this camper with California license plates was stopped in Arizona by undercover agents of the Sheriff's Department. The agents made this arrest after observing an airplane that landed, transferred material to the camper, then departed without lights. Inside the camper, the agents found 1,000 pounds of marijuana worth $128,000. They also found walkie-talkie radios, camouflage netting, and two high-powered rifles with telescopic sights. One of the two men arrested was a California high school teacher. Last year, 17 aircraft were caught smuggling drugs, mostly marijuana, from Mexico to the United States. Usually arrests resulted because of accidents or intelligence supplied by informers. Bill Hughes of U.S. Customs District Number 8. Well, air smuggling is the major problem. It's a huge sky. Trying to find something in it with uh, no information is practically impossible. Before he retired from the business, pilot Rick Esch smuggled more than a ton of Mexican marijuana. He rented the aircraft used, failed to tell the owners he was going to Mexico, and made out his own papers. Well, the paper that they give you is a notarized paper stating, in fact, that the registered airplane number so-and-so and so forth, U.S. registry, uh, piloted by so-and-so, uh, has permission from the owner so-and-so and so-and-so so -and -so to enter and travel in, in the uh, country of Mexico. And it's witnessed and stamped by a notary and signed by the owner. Well, it's nothing to, to do. You can type up one of those yourself, put in all that information and sign the owner's name and put some seal on there of some type and put it in an envelope and address it to the commandante and seal it up. And when you get to the border, why, you just give it to him and he's... Real happy about that. Rick, of the uh, six trips that you made carrying marijuana from Mexico to the United States, how many loads did you move out from Puerto Vallarta? Three. Puerto Vallarta, where Esch obtained three plane loads of marijuana, is a small beach resort on the western coast of Mexico. Here, the most flourishing business is the tourist trade, catering primarily to Americans in search of sun, surf, and fun. For some, this is an ideal place to combine vacation pleasures with transactions in the local narcotics business, also catering to Americans. We came here with Rick Ash to meet his connection in the wholesale marijuana traffic. This reporter would pose as a wealthy businessman from New York, a friend of Ash's, willing to finance a big deal in marijuana. The connection who provided Esch with plain loads of marijuana lives in this house, is the son of a wealthy and influential family in Puerto Vallarta. This is Miguel Montecan, 25 years old. Rick Esch. He's the connection. You've got to say he's connecting the, the American part to the Mexican part, the, the smuggler to the ranchero. And the rancheros, they furnish the grass and they get the money, and then he gets his. We got along good, and we trusted each other as much as he can trust a gringo, and I can trust a Mexican connection. Our conversations with Miguel Montecan were filmed or recorded without his knowledge at different times and places. Composite highlights of picture and sound follow. During the first conversation with the connection, Esch said he had a wealthy buyer in tow. This guy that's with me, uh, Jay, kind of semi-retired, you know, he got a little money. So I said, well, there's a lot of money to be made down here, investments and things like that. I'd like to do something. I want, I want to make something to you know. Can you turn me on to anybody that's, say, for 500 pounds or something again? I can. I've got it. 500 pounds of marijuana could be supplied, he said, within a week. The price and details of the transaction would be discussed with that wealthy businessman from New York and witnessed by a camera hidden in a suitcase. Rick's told me about the deal, and it sounds good. Uh, but I want to hear it from you. Uh, okay, look at it. Everything 
everything has all right. You know, I want to make sure you are both got the same figures and the whole bit. And how much and... The price is, is uh, 250 pesos, there is a $20. That's right, about $20 a kilo, right? Mm -hmm. Now you can supply, as Brick told me, 500 pounds. What about the deposit? The deposit is only for my cousin and each other, you understand me? For make sure the business. Yeah. You like the grass? You like the grass? Okay, you have it. But you like the grass, the grass you have your hundred dollars, you know? But okay, that's your word, right? That's my word, yeah. Okay. My word. The proposed deal, 500 pounds of marijuana for $5,000. $100 down, the balance to be paid upon delivery. The proposed place of delivery, Punta Mita, a point 25 miles by Jungle Road north of Puerto Vallarta, where Matagan said his family owns 80 acres of coastline property. Previously, Rick Esch had landed aircraft on a dirt road here to pick up marijuana delivered by Miguel Matagan. We discussed the proposed marijuana deal for several days, informed the connection that we would not be interested in just one shipment, asked whether he could supply 500 pounds of marijuana each week. About 500 a week? Could you supply that? Of course. We we'll make it. I like to deal with just one group, you know? It's not one group. It's only me and my cousin. And two guys, only one group. No more, you know. Miguel Montecan assured us there would be no problems with the police. Man, I have seven years selling and I never be busted. busted. Never. You've never been busted? Mm -hmm. Never. I like to work. I like to make it really, really good. No problem to be clean, you know. Nobody know nothing. But we found that the connection is known at the local headquarters of the Federal Judicial Police. Agent in charge Guillermo Martinez Ortiz first called Montecan one of the major drug dealers in town later dismissed him as small fry compared to this man, whom he accused of being the biggest narcotic trafficker. This is Condelario Ramos, the local police chief of Puerto Vallarta. Police chief Ramos once publicly accused the federal police of protecting drug traffickers, but according to federal agent Martinez Ortiz, Certain municipal authorities interfere a great deal in our work. We have suspicions that they use their authority in a bad way and use their jobs for other ends. We asked, do you know the traffickers have used small planes to smuggle marijuana from Puerto Vallarta to the United States? But yes, for the traffickers, small planes are very important. They load secretly on clandestine strips, which we have already located. Knowing where the strips are, why can't you stop this air traffic? Well, we watch the strips periodically, but we do not have much personnel to watch all the places. The planes load secretly during the night or in the morning and take off in almost all cases for the United States. Agent Martinez Ortiz said one of the American pilots he had seen in the past with known narcotics traffickers was pilot Rick Esch. The only plane I've ever used for smuggling is an Aero Commander. As a good prop clearance from the ground, that's important when you're going into unimproved runways where you have mostly gravel and such. They're long range with uh, auxiliary tanks. This trip, Esch would not pick up a load of marijuana from Miguel Matacan. Our purpose was to expose, not to participate in the drug traffic. We would use this era commander, leased by CBS News, to follow Rick Esch's actual smuggling route from Puerto Vallarta to the United States. On the morning of February 4, 1972, Esch filed a flight plan at the Puerto Vallarta Tower. This flight plan, required by law, stipulated a non-stop flight to Hermosillo, Mexico, a city 160 miles south of the border. But our actual intentions were to land at Punta Mita, where Esch had picked up marijuana from his connection, then to document how an air smuggler with a load of contraband may reach and cross the U.S.-Mexican border undetected. First stop the point where marijuana previously was delivered, Punta Mita, only a 10-minute flight from Puerto Vallarta. I can't remember of any loads where less than uh, 300 pounds, some as high as 700 pounds. That's the uh, road going, uh, split in the center of it, is your runway. For, it's a road, but we use it for a runway.
Normally, Esh would not land here without receiving an all-clear signal. A delivery truck would be waiting near this road. This time, only a mule was waiting. Previously, the marijuana shipments were offloaded from truck to plane by Miguel Matican and his helpers. We usually shut off the left engine and uh, leave the right engine running, and uh, that allows them to get in and out of the door without getting any danger of walking into the crops or getting blown away. We'll put it all right in the cabin. So we'll stay down here about five minutes for, say, 500 pounds. When they finish loading, we we'll start the engine and get out of it. Following Esh's smuggling route, we flew up the west coast of Mexico 450 miles. At the town of Los Mochis, we veered west across the California Baja Gulf at one of its narrowest points. We followed the rugged coastline of the Baja Peninsula up to the small fishing village of Mulehe. We would land here to refuel. Yeah, right down there, Jay, is the strip in Mulehe that we use for refueling. How many times have you landed here when you're hauling grass? About four times I've landed here. The landing strip at Mulehe is short, unpaved, and not exactly flat. For a smuggler carrying a cargo of marijuana or other contraband, this is an ideal refueling stop, according to Rick Esch. Baja lacks communications, and, and most of those airports are, are built for the hotels. Strictly a tourist uh, airport for fishermen and tourists, and that's it. There's no, uh, no customs, there's no officials or anybody there to bother you or to uh, check into your, your thing. We stopped here overnight, met no officials, underwent no inspection. The next morning, we prepared for a non-stop trip to the United States. Once you got the fuel on, you have the range to make it to the United States. You taxi out, take off. The route from Mulehe, northwest along the Baja coast for 26 miles, then back across the Baja Gulf and north to Hermosillo. Hermosillo is a port of entry and exit for aircraft. U.S.-bound planes must clear Mexican customs and immigration at such ports. Our filed flight plan stipulated a landing here, but in Mexico, flight plans can be changed without question. They never ask where you're going in lieu of Hermosillo. They just thank you, and that's it. Esch's air smuggling route from Hermosillo, Mexico, to the U.S. border northeast across the Sierra Madre Mountains, then due east to skirt mountain peaks up to 11,000 feet. The normal terrain through here is 8.5, 8,500 feet. If you went down here, if you survived the uh, initial crash, it's doubtful to me whether you could survive uh, to walk out. About 60 miles south of the border, we turned north, followed a valley that would lead us to Lordsburg, and to our final destination, Silver City, New Mexico. But what are the chances of an air smuggler crossing the border without being detected? First, would we be seen by U.S. air defense or FAA radar? All I know is that from previous trips going across the border, that by maintaining uh, anywhere from 50 to 100 feet above the ground, I've been able to successfully get across. We hit the deck 40 miles south of the border. These mountains on uh, our left and our right now are protective from radar. As long as you were below those peaks, you wouldn't have any problem. What if a rancher reported a low-flying plane? If they did report it and get good connections and get it to the right authority, by the time they took precautionary measures at, uh, at the border or wherever they suspected I'd come through, I'd be there and gone, you know. I've got one sure way of knowing that I've crossed the border, and that is an abandoned railroad track just about 10 miles north of the border. And when I cross over that, I know that I've crossed. And that means I'm home free. Next stop, Lordsburg. 
Lordsburg, New Mexico, 70 miles north of the border. There's an airstrip here, but no control tower. Now make a touch and go. Why do you just do a touchdown here? What's the purpose of it? The reason when I leave, leave Lordsburg, I climb right up into radar. In other words, you pretend that you're taking off from Lordsburg, that you were in the USA all the time. Right. Yeah. From Lordsburg, we climbed to 4,000 feet, then contacted the FAA radar control center at Albuquerque, New Mexico. 4-6 Charlie Foxtrot, leaving Lordsburg to go to Silver City for fuel. Our final destination, Silver City, New Mexico, a 13-minute flight from Lordsburg. So the only purpose of landing here, so far as smuggling operation is concerned, is just to pick up gas. Yes, however, I still got uh, 80 gallons of fuel. I could go other places, but this has been, this has been a good field. The uh, proof of the pudding, Rake, is whether there are uh, any customs people down here, right? Yeah, seeing though you didn't notify them. Time of arrival, 4 p.m., February 5, 1972. We met no customs inspectors. None are stationed here because Silver City is not a U.S. port of entry. Previously, after refueling, Esch flew his cargoes of marijuana from here to wholesale buyers in eastern and midwestern states. After the flight of 46 Charlie Foxtrot, we asked government officials a number of questions. We asked the Defense Department, to what extent is air defense radar capable of spotting low-flying planes crossing the Mexican border? Here is what we were told. Only one air defense radar site, this one at Mount Laguna near San Diego, is capable of observing air traffic crossing the Mexican border. But this site sees only 200 miles of the border east of San Diego. The remaining 1,700 miles of the Mexican border are not scanned by air defense radar. Our crossing was 250 miles east of the extreme range of the Mount Laguna radar site. In any case, the Defense Department says it has no mandate to track and report suspected air smugglers. We asked the Federal Aviation Administration to explain its responsibilities, if any, in intercepting air smugglers. We also wanted to know whether the border crossing of 46 Charlie Foxtrot could have been detected by the FAA's radar control center at Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we asked permission to interview an FAA spokesman there. In reply, we received this telegram from the FAA, which refused our request for information that is unclassified. This decision, said the FAA, is based on the fact that our FAA radar centers exist to provide a common system of air traffic control and navigation for civil and military aircraft. It is our strong conviction that the proposed television discussion of the effectiveness of FAA radar coverage in the southern New Mexico area as it relates to illegal narcotics traffic, would mislead the public as to the primary purpose of FAA radar. Further, we are convinced that a public discussion of this type would provide the smuggler, or would-be smuggler, additional information with which to plan his tactics. Your understanding of our position on this matter will be appreciated. Officially, the FAA refused to say whether or not it is responsible for monitoring air smuggling. Unofficially, FAA spokesman told us that tracking and reporting suspected air smugglers is not a mandated function of the FAA radar system. It appears that no government agency is responsible for the radar tracking of air smugglers. Yet a spokesman for U.S. Customs has said on this broadcast that air smuggling is the major problem in coping with the narcotics traffic from Mexico. We believe that public awareness of the facts as to why this is the major problem could be of value in solving the problem. We disagree with the FAA's conviction that a discussion of the subject would mislead the public. There is evidence, more of which you are about to hear, that air smugglers are well informed about the radar situation on the border. Let us see just how sophisticated and well organized this business of air smuggling really is. Bill Hughes, customs agent in charge of District 8. Well, air smuggling is a well-organized uh, operation. For example, in this one case that we, we have here that we recently concluded, uh, this is an organization of air smugglers. Sixteen people were involved, and they moved uh, approximately 5,000 pounds of marijuana into the United States. 
worth about a half a million dollars in a, in a short space of time. The brains of this organization, which we came to refer to as the company, were uh, Dr. Willis B. Hollingsworth, a uh, veterinarian from Savannah, Georgia, and William Estes, he was uh, the bookkeeper, the financier of the, the operation. We asked Bill Estes, former accountant and law student, why his group decided to smuggle by air. Well, the, uh, the doc who uh, was one of the people that was in the main five, he uh, knew a pilot that flew in Vietnam and was a good pilot, and he could land in a field or on an airstrip or on a, on a road anywhere. And uh, it's the safest way because he knew where to go across the border and where the radar was and how to beat the radar system. How did he know about that? Did he, uh, did he experiment? Did he... No, so he worked for the government in uh, New Mexico and Arizona, and he went across the border many times. The various of the members had... Uh various functions to perform, but uh, they hired a pilot, David Willingham, an excellent pilot, former military trained, and uh, hired airplanes, uh, this is the one we caught them in, and uh, through a, uh, various air routes they would enter Mexico and pick up their marijuana at one of two places, either at Sabinas Hidalgo, here in the state of Nuevo León, or at Mazatlan in the state of Sinaloa. On one of their trips into Mazatlan, they ran into some trouble with the Mexican officials. And as a result of ironing out that uh, difficulty, they entered into an agreement with these Mexican officials. Well, we had to pay them $5,000 for the time that, that they caught us for protection, not to, uh, for a bribe or whatever you want to call it. And from then on in, we bought our marijuana from them and we gave them, besides the purchase, we gave them $5,000 protection. And then we could land anywhere we wanted to, because there's no way we could get picked up, because they were the police who would apprehend you. Are you saying that you actually bought the marijuana from these police officials themselves? Yes, sir. They were the suppliers? Yes, sir. How was the price? Was it... It was lower. It was better quantity, better quality, and lower price, and plus, our people could go right to their fields and pick out different fields and pick out the better marijuana. Right so to the officials' fields? Yes, sir. Did you s actually see evidence that these Mexican officials were protecting you in one way or another? And every time we landed the airplane down, they would be there with their official cars and, and uniforms, and they would they handle the uh, pickup and delivery. And they would uh, barricade off the road to make sure no stranger came down the road who wasn't wanted. Oh, wait a minute. They would barricade off what road? Where you were going to land? Where, where we were going to use for a landing strip, yes, sir. How would they barricade it off? What would they do? Well, they had big uh, hay trucks. I guess they were large trucks, like four-ton trucks. And they would bring one in and one in, one down the other end, and they'd be full of people. And nobody could get by them. Well, that was an arrangement uh, whereby you really couldn't miss, could you? No, sir. There was no way to miss. Did you personally see any of the payoffs to these Mexican officials? I personally made the payoffs. These people moved uh, their marijuana into the United States to uh, mainly to Norman, Oklahoma or Indianapolis, Indiana and then it was uh, they met with surface uh, vehicles, trucks and one thing or another and uh, the marijuana was taken on to the to the dealers that distributors up in uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, uh, Savannah, Georgia, uh, New York, uh, throughout the country. Among the distributors were five other members of the Estes family. The father, Malcolm Sr., sons Gary Estes, an architect, and Malcolm Jr., Bill Estes' wife Trudy, a college student, Malcolm Jr.'s wife Martha, college student. Had your organization worked up to the point where you were, were going to be able to supply large amounts of marijuana on a regular basis? Yes, sir. We, every week we'd uh, give them a large quantity. Now, it was never enough because as we grew, they grew, and they began long before we did. And we actually had, had to compete with other people for the business. The end purpose was to bring in how much a week to the United States? Well, one plane load a well, week, which would be a thousand pounds a week. On May 1, 1972, Bill Estes was sentenced to 10 years in the federal penitentiary. The sentences of other members of the company ranged from indeterminate up to 10 years. The Treasury Department, Bureau of Customs, uh, 
uh, spent a, about 4,600 man hours of special agent's time in this one case. And these things are going on daily. How they turn and they're going north up the uh, rear of the house traders be east side of them. Okay, 16, 10, 4. Customs agents at work near the border at El Paso, Texas. Okay, uh, somebody come over to the car and I didn't see where they come from. Okay, he's got something, uh, a package in his hand there. You're under you arrest right. for a violation of the narcotic laws. During 1971, U.S. Customs agents in districts on the border arrested 4,881 persons. 82% of the arrests were for violation of the narcotics law. Seizures of drugs smuggled from Mexico included 54 pounds of heroin, some of French origin, and 148,000 pounds of marijuana. But did this put much of a dent in the Mexican drug traffic? Customs agent Bill Hughes. I don't see where there's been a dent put in the domestic inventories uh, of narcotics. So obviously, all of the uh, uh, people that are engaged in, in trying to stop this traffic are not winning the war. The so-called war on the border has not been won by tripling the number of customs personnel. More seizures and arrests are being made, but the mainstream of the traffic in Mexican-produced drugs is not being stopped here. What about stopping the traffic at its source? Under Mexican law, cultivation of opium poppies and marijuana is an offense punishable by two to nine years in prison. But what is being done to enforce the law? The Attorney General of Mexico, Pedro Ojeda Pauiada. What we do in the states of Sinaloa, which traditionally has greater amounts of drugs, Chihuahua in the mountains, Durango in the mountains, and now Michoacán and Guerrero, also in the mountains, is to cover with small planes and helicopters, determine where the plants are being grown, and by land, through military squads and the federal judicial police, destroy the plants. In March 1972, we observed part of a campaign to destroy poppy and marijuana fields in the state of Sinaloa, Mexico. This state includes a vast range of the Sierra Madre Mountains, encompasses more than 22,000 square miles, mostly wild and uninhabited. In mountain valleys, fields of poppies and marijuana are cultivated near small remote villages. When the fields are spotted from the air, squads of soldiers either hike here from mountain bases or are flown to the location by helicopters. During a period of 11 days, we witnessed the destruction of nine marijuana fields. The method of destruction, time consuming and rather primitive. In this particular location, it took an entire day for a squad of eight soldiers to root out two adjacent fields of marijuana. Sanchez Neira of the Mexican Federal Judicial Police was in charge of the campaign. Now, as soon as you finish cleaning up this field, is it likely that they'll come back and replant it again? I suppose it's coming back again. And uh, they're planting again because the land is very good. And you can see they have water not too far to here. And you can, they can make and use it again. Isn't that a little frustrating for you? Oh, yes, it's frustrating, but it's my work. Once they've planted again, sure. how long will it take uh, for the uh, marijuana to grow up again? Well, like, they're the same size. One month. One um, month? Sure. You sure. came back here in one month, this field might be full of marijuana again. Uh -huh. Maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know. You hope not? I hope not, but maybe yes. The statement of Mexico's Attorney General. Between October 1969 and December 1971, we destroyed 4,876 patches of marijuana. There are no figures as to what percent of total cultivation in Mexico was eliminated or how many of those marijuana patches were quickly replanted. During our 11-day observation of the campaign, we also witnessed the destruction of five poppy fields. The Mexican government says 24,888 poppy patches were destroyed throughout Mexico in the past 15 months. Again, what percentage of total opium production was destroyed is unknown. In Mexico, opium poppies are planted and harvested twice a year. What would be the value of just one harvest of opium from this field, estimated to be about two and a half acres? Two millions, Mexican money. Two millions and a half. That's about $160,000, isn't yes, it? Yes, more or less. 
two harvests in one year would yield $320,000 worth of opium just from this one field. Who is getting the money? We tried to discuss that question with the mayor of a village in a valley where practically nothing but opium appears to be cultivated. The mayor who lives in this house may have heard we were coming. His wife told us. He went camping yesterday and he hasn't returned yet. When will he come? Who knows? I don't know. He might return in a little while or tomorrow. I don't know. Does he usually leave like this for so long a time? Well, yes, he goes and stays around there to camp. He stays there for many days. Sometimes he comes, sometimes not. Since he has cattle there, he has to take care of them. One villager who did not go camping, this old gentleman said he had lived in the valley all his life. We asked him, what do the people grow in this valley? Here to raise cattle, to raise cattle to plant corn. There are a few corn plants. And where are the fields of corn? Now it isn't the time of the rains. It is during the rain that the corn is planted, very little of it because there is no place to grow. And so how do you live? In a very limited fashion, in a very backward, limited fashion. What is growing in the fields that we see along the valley? I have no knowledge of these things. I do not go out from here. Here I am busy in my home. Some arrests are made, but proof of guilt is hard to obtain unless the farmers are caught in the act of tending the plants. Often poppies and marijuana are cultivated on state lands, and the actual ownership of privately held fields is difficult to trace. In any case, the farmers who tend the fields undoubtedly earn more than they would receive from crops of corn or beans. But they live simply and do not appear to be wealthy from the profits of opium. Who really controls and profits from these fields? We asked Sanchez Neira of the Mexican Federal Police. The farmers are working for somebody else. Uh -huh. is that it? The big guy. The, the big, big guy. Uh -huh. They call him big guy here. The so-called big guy obtains the opium and has it converted to heroin. This man, who cannot be identified, was a wholesaler of heroin in the interior of Mexico. We asked him who controls and finances the opium and heroin traffic in Mexico. 95% of the, of the narcotic uh, is financed uh, by people from the United States. But are you saying that people from the United States go down into Mexico here and, and actually make arrangements with farmers, or are they dealing... There was some you? dealers, yeah, dealers and farmers, they go and talk together with them. Sure they do. Uh, do you know of any instances where people from the United States actually leased or rented land uh, for the purpose of growing? They well, never rent it on their name. They rent it on another guy's name from over there, a worker from over there or something like that. See, they never go on and put their own name on, on no land. But do you know for a fact that people from the United States have rented land? Like That's that? right. That's right. And they, in fact, then control the land on which those poppies are grown? Most of them, yeah. Like us, 85% of them. We asked the Attorney General of Mexico, Pedro Ojeda Pauillada, whether American groups directly control opium cultivation in Mexico. Well, I am sure there is high financing from organized groups, but I don't know which these groups are. My impression is that someone delivers a quantity of money to the farmer for planting the crop. Later, more money is given during the cultivation time. And again, another amount of money is given after the harvest. And from there, the drugs go to a place where larger quantities are stored, probably from several different patches or farms. And from there, it is transported by many types of facilities, plane, car, truck. I believe that the persons who perform these tasks know from the start where they are going to send this stuff. In the cities, including Culiacan, the capital of Sinaloa, police have found laboratories that convert opium to heroin. Of seven laboratory operators arrested, five were North Americans. The man on the left is a French-Canadian. His companion is from Seattle, Washington. According to Mexican authorities, the economy of Sinaloa's capital, Culiacan, is supported to a large extent by the drug traffic. Many of the biggest dealers live in this section called Tierra Blanca, some in mansions. You can see one house of the big guy here in Culiacan with swimming pool, everything. They call him Lalo Fernandez. 
That house is only 35 air miles from these poppy fields. In one area here, we spotted 20 landing strips for aircraft. If the big drug dealers can afford to build landing strips in these mountains to facilitate the transportation of their opium, then it would seem they can afford to pay for protection of their interests. General Flores Sital commands the military district of the state of Sinaloa. He told us that he personally was offered 1 million pesos, $80,000, if he would agree not to send soldiers into one opium valley within his district. The general said he refused the offer and that immediately thereafter, jurisdiction over that opium valley was transferred to another military district. Mexico is making greater efforts to stop the cultivation of these fields. But according to the government, cultivation is increasing with demand. The traffic is not being stopped here. At this joint seminar of Mexican and U.S. narcotics officers in Mexico City, Mexican officials were praised for their efforts. John Ingersoll, director of the U.S. Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, speaking on January 11, 1972. We have told our Congress in the United States that in no place in the world has the level of cooperation developed to the point that it has with Mexico. Total USA to Mexico to combat the problem. In 11 years, about one and a half million dollars for training and equipment. Presently, Mexico has only eight small planes and five helicopters to locate and ferry troops to drug fields throughout the country. More and better equipment is needed. This is Skip Henderson, an American helicopter pilot training Mexican pilots for the campaign to destroy drug fields. I have a feeling, and quite often, that we could accomplish a lot more than we're actually doing. How could you do that? Well, now, I would say that we need more equipment, first air equipment, bigger helicopters to carry more people to the scene in a shorter period of time, and to have and develop new means. We're, we're using old means, but that's the best means we know of destroying the plant itself. If we could develop a fire or a herbicide which would successfully destroy its growth and, if possible, not destroy the, the ground itself for other uses. We asked the Attorney General of Mexico what would be the greatest help the United States could give Mexico in combating cultivation of opium and marijuana. Well, perhaps joking, the best help would be that there didn't exist a demand, and I'm sure that this is the main concern of the United States also. There is concern in the United States, of course. In 1969, a presidential task force reported that the availability of Mexican-produced drugs has significantly affected the increase of drug abuse in this country. It said more can be done to attack the problem at its source. By source, the task force had in mind those opium and marijuana fields in Mexico. It recommended, among other things, development of sensory devices to locate the fields, more efficient methods to destroy them, and an expansion of radar facilities to curtail air smuggling across the Mexican-U.S. border. If steps are being taken in those directions, their imprint is not very obvious. In any case, the real source of the traffic in Mexican-produced drugs is not in Mexico. It lies, as the Attorney General of Mexico suggested, in the appetites and demands of the U.S. market. Increasing expenditures of tax dollars here, increasing arrests of traffickers by increasing numbers of law enforcement officers have not put much of a dent in the traffic. This is Jay McMullen for CBS Reports. Good night. But if I have 100 kilos over there of uh, opium, I have all visitors from the States and anything else offer me anything to get. You like the grass? You like the grass? Okay, you have it. But you like the grass? The grass, you have your hundred dollars, you know? But okay, that's your word, right? That's my word, yeah. Okay. My word. These mountains on uh, our left and our right now are protective from radar. As long as you were below those peaks, you wouldn't have any problems. That's a dope dealer. He's a fugitive from the United States on a murder charge. <laughs> 